Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye of the Lord. The church is now called.
five, seven, eight, sorry.
Lord, thank you again for providing us with you. Thank you for providing us with everything we need this day. We are grateful for this, and we give back to you, Lord, tonight for the Lord's day. We want to go far with you in the Lord's fields and the other projects this afternoon. We give in national costume and this is a story of a little girl called Mary and Mary's going to help us in the moment to tell the story now Mary lived in a very very beautiful place with a big lake but a long long way from the town and it was a place called Lanvihangel that's a difficult word, isn't it? Land be hangle. Double L in Welsh, be club, club. So can be hangle. And the one thing that Mary wanted more than anything else, and have a guess what that was. And I put it here in the Welsh language. So Mary, you come up here, and I'll call the other one in a moment. Come up here. And you show them what you've got there. Okay. That's right. What's that? Anybody can tell me? The Bible. The Bible. Good. Yes. In Welsh is Ur Babel. Ur Babel. The Bible. And uh, it's a special, special book. Because why is the Bible a special book? Yeah? Yes, good. We learn about Jesus. We learn about things to do right and not to do things wrong. And the Bible is a special book. Now, in 1870, when Mary lived, she wanted a Bible, but there was a problem. She could not afford the Bible. So, she had a little basket. So, you can show them what to do. So what Mary did was she cleaned, so show them how you clean, and sweep, good, and help with the chickens on the farm, collect the eggs, and for all these little jobs that she did, she got money in the basket. 
and she used to count, count the money. She used to count the money every day in order to be able to afford a Bible. But she wanted a Bible. And uh, she didn't have enough money. So what do you think she did, boys and girls? What do you think she did? She didn't have enough money. I'll take these cards out. Have you seen that? What do you think she did? She prayed to Jesus. Please, Jesus, if it's your will, let me have some more money that I can put in my basket for a Bible. And Jesus gave her some work to do. But this time it was on the farm. So you show them how you rake up the hay. Good. And she raked up the hay. And she put in the basket. And eventually the farmer said, all right, Mary, I'll give you some money for your Bible. So she got the money. She counted it all. And she had enough money for the Bible. In those days, it was about 20 Pence. Now, that seems not very much, but those days it was a lot of money. So, where's my uh, minister then? Where's the pastor? Okay. So, the pastor, come here. We'll have you come on the platform so everybody can see that you're a pastor. He's an honorary pastor. He hasn't f fulfilled all his degrees yet. He's an honorary pastor. So, Mary wanted to go to Pastor Charles, also, okay, you take this one, you take five, okay. So she went to Pastor Charles, she got up on the platform, and uh, you shake hands with him, and you can tell him, I won't tell you what to say much, but in English you can tell him that you got the money for the Bible. Good, and you give him the money for the Bible. Some the or something. Like that. Anyway, give him the money for the Bible. Okay, and what do you do? You say to Mary, I am very pleased to give you the Bible. And may God bless you. This is the Bible telling us about Jesus. Thank you. And Mary Jones got the Bible. Now, in order to get that Bible, she had to walk 28 miles. And I know some young people who have actually walked from Landa Hangel um, to Bala. 28 miles, just because she wanted a Bible. But, you know, boys and girls, it's no good having a Bible unless we do something about it. Because there was a little boy one day, and he was dusting. And mummy said, don't touch that, don't touch that, that's God's book. So he said, well, we better send it back to him because they never use it. <laughs> so the Bible is no good unless we read it and use it. So I hope, boys and girls, that you will read God's word every day. God bless you. Amen.
Such is the company of those who seek you, who seek the face of God, of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battles. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift it up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Can you turn your Bibles again to Malachi chapter 3, and I shall be reading from verse 6 to 8. Do not change. Therefore, before you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall I return? How shall we return, sorry? Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how will we be robbing you? In your tithes and offerings? This is the word of the Lord.
the church? Amen. Let me call myself in the back seat. It wasn't as beautiful as that. At this moment in time, we will now be bringing to you Brother Leslie Wood, who will be providing us with uh, the word for today. Brother Leslie Wood um, is, one of those two words, is, was a member of Slough Church. He's recently moved down to Wales, back home, and he will be providing us with the word today. Amen. Brother Leslie, Slough Church. Slough Church. Brother Leslie. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity of sharing the way you have de delivered me in a miraculous way. I thank you too for your word, for your promises, and pray that you will um, bless us today, and may thy Holy Spirit speak for our hearts. Amen. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the passage of Scripture that we read, to Psalm 24. You know that the Psalms were written by David and Heman and the sons of Korah. And this is a, a very, very particular psalm. But mention something I want to talk about this morning. The earth belongs to God. Everything in all the world is His. He is the one who pushed the oceans back to let the dry land appear. I like very much the commentary of Clark. He says this about this text. He is the creator, the governor, the owner. It is his property. We are his property. Men may claim districts and kingdoms as property. For God is Lord of the soil, Lord of the oil, the Lord of all. I want you to notice that the psalm talks about the creator, the God, the owner. He is the owner of everything. And Moffat in his translation of Psalm 24 says this, The earth belongs to the eternal, and all the earth, holds its inhabitants. I don't know about you, but um, summertime has always been a time for me of camp. And I remember as a young boy going to camp. And uh, it was a time of staying up quite late at night to have a very good chat and talk with our, all my friends. And we talk about all sorts of subjects. And uh, one particular camp, Hal and Jim, were having a serious conversation. And uh, Hal asked Jim a very difficult question. He said, if you had to give up everything but one thing in your life, what would you keep? Have you ever asked yourself that question? If you had to give up everything but one thing in your life, what would you keep? So Hal was not very serious most of the time, but he was that night. So the answer was, I have to give up everything. Jimmy responded, all but one thing. What's the most important thing to you? Jimmy thought. 
and answer. I can narrow it down to three. To three? Yes, yes. I keep my family. I keep Becky, my girlfriend, because she's very attractive and we get on very well together up and give her up. And my TV. Because that's important to me. There's so many things on there that really, really entertain me. And then the question was, what about God? <coughs> You would give him up for Becky? Oh, no. I've forgotten about God. And with that text that we read this morning, it tells us that God is the owner. He is the creator. He's the governor. He's the boss. But very, very often we forget God. And that there are so many different ways of uh, forgetting God. And I want us to turn to Genesis 28, verse 20 to 22. Genesis 28, verse 20 to 22. I want you to notice something very interesting in this text. That's Genesis 28, verse 20 to 22. And I'm reading from the Life Application uh, for a Bible for students. So that's Genesis 28, verse 20 to 22. And this is about Jacob. Just note what it says here. And Jacob vowed this vow to God. If God will help and protect me on this journey and give me food and clothes, and will bring me back safely to my father, then I will choose Jehovah as my God. And this memorial pillar shall become a place of worship, and I will give you back a tenth of everything you give me. And this place shall become a place of worship, and I will give you back a tenth of everything you give me. Jacob recognized that God was his owner. He was the governor, he was the boss. And the things that Jacob had was just to share. He didn't really own them. And then I want you to turn to um, Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10. Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10. Proverbs is a book of wisdom, and this is full of wisdom in this text. Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10, and it says, Honour the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income. Notice that. It doesn't say the second. It doesn't say the dregs. It doesn't say the third, it doesn't say the fourth. It doesn't say, uh, oh, oh, sorry, oh, I forgot. But I will remember next time. It doesn't say that. It says, honour the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income. So this means that the governor, the boss, has his proper duty because we remember him first, not last. And he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wines. If you travel about three miles from here westward to Sippenham, there's a very old building there, which was a tithe barn. And the tithe barn in the 15th, 16th century was bringing in the crops, was bringing in the grain, was bringing in the fruit, and they store it in the tithe barn. Today, we are to honour God with the first fruits of all our money. Now that means whether we're on job seekers allowance, whether we're on maternity benefit, whether we're on anything at all as a student, whatever money we get, God is first. And I do passionately believe, friends, 
go, we should teach our children this as well. Not wait until they're baptized or wait until they're members of the church. But when they get pocket money, when granddad or grandma or uncle give them money, tell them that one tenth belongs to God. So one tenth of a hundred pounds is ten pounds. And you notice, if you turn to Malachi, that in Malachi, it links something else other than time. And Malachi is in the Minor Prophets. And a lot of people think, oh, the Minor Prophets is not important. But it's the way it's been placed in the canon, the biblical canon. But it is important. Malachi was a messenger of God. And he had just an important message to deliver as Isaiah, Jeremiah, any of the other prophets. And this is what he says. Will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? Where I live in, in Wales is about 12 miles from Cardiff. And Cardiff is unbelievably a, a, a place where thieves and robberies take place. And people seem at the moment, because of the recession, to rob other people. But here Malachi said, will a man rob God? Surely not. Yet you have robbed me. Seven years ago, I was head gardener on a very large estate in the country. I grew orchids, I grew anthuriums, I grew all sorts of things. And I looked after this big estate and we opened it to the public. And I had a grace and favour house. That meant that if I lost my job, I'd lose my house. And this was a very, very old house. And apparently uh, history tells us that um, the monks stayed in the house. So I suppose a lot of monkey business went on, I don't know. <laughs> But I was living right opposite a cemetery. So I used to keep the wheelbarrow right near the cemetery in case anything happened and all my wife had to do was wheel the wheelbarrow into the cemetery. It was so funeral expenses. But I was on £16 pound a week. £16 pound a week. I'm not going to be embarrass you this morning of asking how many of you could survive on £16. Pound. But I was on £16. Pound a week. After I was there a few years, it went up to about £18 or £19. Pound. But two things that my wife and I wanted more than anything else was a refrigerator and a washing machine. Maybe two things. We had a, a pantry, and we used to put uh, butter and the milk in the pantry, but it wasn't any good. You know, it would go off. So I was teaching piano at the time to two pupils, um, a bank manager's children, who was bank manager of West Minster Bank. And I earned a little bit of money. So one day, he desperately wanted this washing machine. So we got down the fork and I said to my wife, well, shouldn't we go and understand, you know, if little things going off and butter going off and milk going off, shouldn't we understand? So I mean, if we talk to God and say, Lord, you understand. I know you don't live down here in the same house as I do, but you do understand that, you know, I can't put butter and milk and it all going off. So if I pay you, Or pay you some time, you know, when I get the money, would that be okay? This was the way I was reasoning. Until my wife and I read this text. Will a man rob God? Surely not. And I realised I could not rob God. So, we put the tithe in the envelope and put it into the church at Oxford. And we prayed that God somehow would provide a washing machine. Within three days, bank manager's wife, Yvonne, said, Oh, Leslie, uh, would you like a washing machine? 
It's a Benedict's one, it's very good. We don't want one because, you know, we're getting a new one. So I said, oh, that guy's really good. So I got this big trolley, garden trolley, and went round to my house, loaded the washing machine on the trolley and brought it back. Well, when my wife saw it, it was like me facing Jessica. Hey, that's right. She was very annoyed, and I can see her really looking at me and frowning. Where did you get that from? I said, from the bank manager's wife. I said, what? Did you break in? I said, no, I didn't break in. I said, she just gave it to me. She said, are you sure you're not owing money to her? I said, no, it's free. I said, actually, God told her to give it to me. So, you're not like, if you argue with me, you argue with God as well. <laughs> so she bought this washing machine, bought it round and placed it in the house. About a week later, not the, the, the fridge, but about a week later, if one said, would you like a washing machine as well? I thought, oh, no, we're in real trouble now. <laughs> What's she going to say this time? I said, it's okay, I don't want one, we're going to get a, a different one, a new one, so you might as well have it. We don't want to put it on the scrap, do we? I said, no. So we went round, got the washing machine. I won't tell you what my wife said at that time. She didn't believe me that I'd got it free. I said, are you sure you're not owing any money? I said, absolutely sure. Or the washing machine. Now, I want to tell you something. But that refrigerator, because we had paid tithe and offerings to the church, lasted 25 years. Amen. And no engineer. Praise God for that. Amen. We had no engineer, nothing went wrong with it. How long did you think that the other item lasted? Sorry? Uh, yes, it's just one more, one more year. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we had those two things, and nothing went wrong. Will a man rob God? You have robbed me of the tithes and offerings, and so the awesome curse of God. And then it says here, try it. Let me prove it to you. Your crops will be large, but I will guard them from insects and plagues. And when I read that, I thought, don't worry, Leslie, God's going to guard your refrigerator and washing machine. Nothing's going to go wrong. And he did. God has so many different ways of blessing us. We know nothing about that. And he's not limited. God is not limited. He's not a God that's limited to one way or the other. He's flexible. And he, he blessed me absolutely abundantly over that. So from now on, I've always put him first. Let me read you this. To hold back from giving tithe and offerings through self-interest is to deprive ourselves of all good things God would give us. And 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. Why did God say that? I'll tell you why he said that. Money in itself is good. It can be useful to help people, but it is addictive. Money is addictive. This is why people get themselves into debt. This is why People find it so, so difficult to control it. This is the reason why relationships often break up. Because one is a compulsive spender and the other one wants to be frugal and careful with money. And many young couples have found it very difficult how to juggle the two and balance it out. Estella was a young Christian lady. And she had terrible problems. Whenever she went shopping, 
look at the first. Oh dear. I've got nothing left to pay the bills. Because when she went shopping, she used to see the things that she wanted rather than the things she needed. And the things that she wanted overtook the things that she needed. So it was like being pushed in one direction, another direction, one direction, another direction. Until she read an article in the Review Herald. Why not ask God to be in your shopping basket? What? What? Why not ask God to be in your shopping basket? So when you go out shopping, say, God, please come with me. Because I have this terrible problem that I want to spend so much money that I don't have enough money to give to you. Do you think it worked? Yes, yeah, it worked. And she'd pray every time that she went out. She'd ask God to help her. And then when she was going to the supermarket, when she was going to the clothes shop, instead of seeing that lovely hat and that beautiful blouse and the lovely shoes that she could wear and all this, the thought came to her, do you want it or do you need it? Difference. Because we are people that are governed by desires, governed by impulses. Governed by on the cuff judgment. So when God spoke to her, do you want, want it or do you need it? She came back with the money. The other thing, these are very good. They can do many things. But one thing that has destroyed a lot of people so that the debt counselors don't have any sleep because they are trying to work out people that got into debt. One thing is that they can rule and ruin your life. 27% is what you pay when you draw money out from one of these credit cards. And what a lot of people do is they use the cards but they don't have the money in the bank to pay it off afterwards. So it mounts up and mounts up and mounts up and gets itself into problems. So the best thing to do is to destroy it. Is to cut it and cut it so everything doesn't show anymore. And don't use it. And then rely upon the cash. You do know where you are with the cash. But sometimes with a credit card, you don't know. And the devil has a way of controlling us. Or us becoming addicted. We see it through television, we see it through pornography, we see it through drugs. But we also through it, see it through money. And this is why God says about tithe and offering. The 4% budget is for the maintenance of the church. And I have been absolutely upset, astounded, and dismayed of the number of churches in Wales that are closing. Chapels that were found by John Wesley and were alive with the message of the Lord. Because people no longer have had the money and put the money to maintain the church. And the 4% that we have, so if a person has £100, that's £4 goes to the maintenance of the church. And then we have special offerings for World Mission and Agile. Uh, I have somebody here this morning, I don't think they'll mind me mentioning it, but they do a wonderful work. I work for Adventist World Radio. And I've heard some wonderful stories of how people have been converted by the radio. And I prayed about it and I decided that once a month I would direct Debbie to Adventist World Radio. 
so that people could be saved for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know. There are so many different ways of using our money. But when we think of other people with our money, we get a blessing. I just want to read this to you. Money itself is not evil. But the love of money leads to all sorts of problems. God warned that refusing to give him tithes and offerings is actually stealing from him. God doesn't want anything to take his place in our life. The best way to keep from making money out of God is to learn the joy of giving it away. Building this habit must begin when we're young. God doesn't need our money, he owns everything but we need to give it away. It's an incredible feeling to see our money go to something besides ourselves. Next, decide where you want to give it away. Most churches support missionaries or world radio, people who have given their lives to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe you could select a missionary and ask to receive his or her monthly prayer letter. At first, it may hurt to give money to something besides yourself. Eventually, however, you'll have such a good time giving that you'll want to give more. And remember that story in Luke 21? And I must emphasize that um, everybody is in a different financial situation. And we give what we can. And God accepts even a small offering that we can give. Now Luke 21, I love this uh, text. And uh, it's the widow's small coins. As he stood in the temple, he was watching the rich tossing the gifts into the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small copper coins. This poor widow has given more than all the rest of them combined. But they have given a little of what they didn't need. But she, poor as she is, has given everything that she has. And in the Focus magazine, and I just quote these two um, short paragraphs to you. The best antidote to wanting and buying things is thinking about others and being generous. The best antidote to wanting and buying things is thinking about others and being generous. Encourage your children to support a favorite charity and involve them in fun and creative funders. That is the, the uh, recent popular focus. No. A few years ago, um, I got myself into a very difficult situation. And this may shock some of you, what I'm going to say now, in closing. But I've always had a battle with money, even though I've tried to pay time and offense. And uh, it was so easy at the age of 60 to get a loan. I just said, oh, I need to pay the car off. I, I need to go to Brazil. And uh, no problem. And got the money. So uh, I, may, I got a, a loan for several thousand pounds. Um, and then this was to pay off the car to go to Brazil. And I didn't have it explained to me that the more you borrow, the higher the interest is. Like I said with this card, the more you get from the card, the higher the interest is. So then um, I happened to have a Sainsbury's credit card. If anybody knows about Sainsbury's, that's why they're multi-millionaires and rich, because the interest on the card is very, very, very high. So the bank said, no problem, don't worry. We'll pay that off. That's good. Well, you have to take out another loan. So I ended up with a £21,000 loan plus interest. And if any of you are mathematicians, I can work that out better than I can. 
it came to £27,000 including insurance. Now I was paying nearly £300 a month out of my £600 salary, or six, seven hundred after tax. And my wife became very worried as to how we could pay it off. And like most people who are addicted, you hide the fact that you have an addiction. But one time I made a mistake. She happened to see the bill that came in. Oh, oh no, I'm facing another church about this time. But the problem was I had nothing to show for it. So the money was going out. And it was ruin, ruining our relationship. And at this time, I was reducing offerings and time for the Lord. And I was going to lose my job because of my age. Remember we knelt down to God with the Bible. And said, Lord, I'm sorry I got myself into this terrible mess. I pray in some way that you will forgive and that you will help me through this maze of death. And I remember we went twice and I became suicidal. I wanted to jump off one of the bridges near Edward because of this death. And death is like getting a rope around your neck and strangling you. That's what it does. And it can ruin your life. So we asked God for help. And I, I, unfortunately I had a breakdown and was losing my job. And after prayer, we decided to do something about it. Whenever you are in debt, you must do something about it. There are debt counselors, there's the Supplies Bureau, there's prayer and even the church. So we prayed and asked that God would somehow help me with his debt. So my bank was Lloyd's, it's still Lloyd's. So eventually they gave us a name of someone in the bank who dealt with debt. So we wrote to them and prayed. And a miracle happened. And I don't want anybody to believe that well, you can do what you like and God helps you out. But in this particular reason, God did. And God is a God of miracles today, just as he was in the Old Testament and New Testament. And don't let anybody push you off with that and say, oh, it's, not, it's a load of rubbish. It isn't rubbish. Do you know what happened? We had a letter from the bank. I hadn't got it to me this morning. And it said, you'll be pleased to know that we've wiped, we've wiped the 27,000 pounds off of your debt. This is Lloyd's Bank. Not, not, not a subsidiary, but Lloyd's National Bank. We had to laugh at 27,000 What? All we had to pay was 2,000 pounds. And my wife didn't borrow the money, she always had money hidden somewhere. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> it's in the cupboard or in the drawer behind the table or somewhere in the front door, she always had money. And someone said to me, um, why did you marry Miriam? I said, well, first of all, she paid for the marriage license because nobody else would. And the other thing is, I take her out and she pays for everything else. <laughs> so she had the £2,000. And you paid it. And being a woman, and having this wonderful, wonderful gift of intuition, she said, I don't want you to take out a loan anymore. So I went to the bank and I asked them to block me from obtaining any loans. 
in case I have the sudden urge to do so. Praise the Lord, I haven't taken out any love for five years. And when I go shopping, I ask God, please come with me, because I make you a little secret. One of the things I love, love doing is spending money on music magazines and classical CDs. I'm doing a musicology course at Cardiff University at the moment, and I'm actually passionate of all the Beethoven sonatas that they are, and we're talking about 10, 12, 15 pounds for a classical CD, particularly if it's the latest recording. But I have asked God to help me. And this is why I have shown you today to tear up your car, and I will only buy it if I've got the money. I want you to remember that, my dear friends, in that Psalm 24, that God is the owner, he's the governor. And he wants us to recognize his ownership in our lives. With tithes and offerings, and helping other people in some way. Um, only the other week, I, I played a piano in the Millennium Center, which is like the Millennium Golden Party. Um, somebody in a music school asked me would I play because Latch is a charity for children, for small children suffering from leukemia and cancer. And I raised 250 pounds for his help. But that helped me a lot, thinking of other people and using my gifts and that towards someone else. So remember, will a man drop God? You won't be in time to not Shall we bow our heads and pray? My gracious Father in heaven, I thank you for the deliverance, for the wonderful answer of prayer that I received. And, and we know that the, the, the devil tries to get us addicted to so many things. And we know that money is a magnet. It's very, very easy to be addicted to it and to overspend. And we thank you, O Lord, for the passages that we read in the Bible. Help us to read them and to remember them and guide us every day in Jesus' name. Amen.
our gracious Father in heaven, we are humbled and stand in awe of your love for us. We thank you for your patience, for your long suffering. When we act impulsively, and when we forget you. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you don't forget us. And we thank you for these wonderful promises that you have given us. They're not just promises, but promises that have been proved by prophets of old and by us living as we do today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.